Welcome to the startup accelerators and packed. I'm co-president Alex Montalbini, MSO8 and founder of Emilio, a real estate development and consulting company to build healthier homes. Thank you for joining Stanford Angels and Entrepreneurs United today. Our group unites the Stanford startup community and innovation centers across the country behind California. Please note that today's event is for educational purposes only and should not be construed as investment advice nor endorsement. Also, a note disclaimer from today's guest speakers. None of the speakers are representatives of any accelerator and they are not speaking on behalf of any accelerator. They are merely sharing a personal perspective at this point in time. Now, I'll hand it over to Sheila for the moderated overview. Thanks, Alex. I'm Sheila Pruva, MS in Computer Science from Stanford and a co-president of the group. We are delighted to welcome four remarkable founders as panelists today. Sarah Tukan is the Chief Product Officer and co-founder of Xena, the cash app of the Middle East. Her startup and product experience spans across the fintech space in the UAE, the prop tech space in London, and the autonomous vehicle space in Silicon Valley. Sarah graduated from Stanford with a bachelor's and master's degrees in mechanical engineering. Her company, Xena, participated in Accelerator Y Combinator earlier this year and Accelerator StartX. Excited to have you, Sarah. Thank you, Sheila and team. Very excited to be speaking on the panel. Thank you for, for the introduction. Alex Sambani is the co-founder and CEO of Slang.ai, a no-code tool for building voice-based virtual agents. Prior to founding Slang, Alex was senior data scientist at Spotify. Alex earned a bachelor's in mechanical engineering from Stanford and an MBA from Harvard Business School. His company, Slang, akin to Squarespace for voice apps, participated in Techstars in 2019 and StartX. Welcome, Alex. Hi, everyone. Nice to meet you all. Sumya Mohan is the co-founder and CEO of Poise, an AI-powered communication coach for online meetings and presentations. Previously, Sumya led product management at Glassdoor, Opower, and Microsoft. Sumya earned an MS in management science and engineering from Stanford and BS in computer science from the Indian Institute of Technology. Sumia's company Poised, considered Grammarly for Speech, participated in the On Deck Accelerator last year. Thank you for joining, Sumia. I assume you're using Poised right now. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Sheila. Definitely trying out Poised, uh, and hopefully it helps me during this meeting. Um, but uh, great, glad to be here and contribute. Thank you. Thanks for inviting me. Thanks. Lawrence Giantilello is CEO and founder of Optory. Optory removes your private information, such as phone numbers from the internet, by opting you out of behind-the-scenes brokers trading your data. Prior, Lawrence was product management and consulting leader at Oracle, Blue K, and Accenture. Lawrence graduated from Stanford with a BA in economics, from Duke with an MBA and Y Combinator in winter of 2012 with startup Screenly. Lawrence's company Optory is currently participating in YC's first early admission batch in winter of 2022 and Accelerator StartX. Welcome, Lawrence. Great. So, Lawrence, help us set the stage. As a relatively early participant in Y Combinator, What's the history of startup accelerators? Yeah, sure. So accelerators are rooted in this concept of the creation of new businesses inside of um, organizations or institutions. And historically, you had established organizations that might start new ventures um, inside of them um, because it was more costly to uh, start a new startup, start a new company. And so companies or institutions that had resources were able to give these new ventures resources to get them started. Um, over time, uh, like in the 90s, for example, you had these incubators that started to emerge that were standalone incubators that were just uh, in the business of creating new companies and um, kind of getting them up and running and then oftentimes spinning them out or um, hopefully ushering them into the public markets. Two of the big names that I remember from that time were Idea Lab and CMGI. Um, they basically incubated companies like eToys, for example. Um, and uh, that was turned out to be really great because you sort of these, took these little um, kind of fledgling ideas, gave them resources, and gave them funding, and helped turn them into big companies. 
but also tend to be a little bit limiting because um, usually incubators have some sort of an agenda. You might have an incubator inside of a university. The agenda might be to bring in funding dollars or to help bring in, um, you know, sort of uh, to, to better the, the, the alumni or the, or the students of that uh, the university. So if you'd have incubators that are associated with different cities, like you might have an incubator that's just focused on startups in Buffalo, New York, for example. And so um, you also lost out a little bit on the um, spontaneity and serendipity um, and creativity that would, that would create these new companies if you limited them to these incubators. And so then you had accelerators really start to take off. And accelerators would sort of take uh, companies that were already started. Maybe you had a founding team, uh, you had an early product, and it didn't matter where the company was based. It could be anywhere in the world or it could be in any industry. It didn't matter if you're, you had some kind of connection to that incubator. Um, and giving them ad advice, giving them money, um, and accelerating their progress. And so uh, the best known I incubator or accelerator that, that I know is, is Y Combinator. It started in 2005 with 10 companies. And uh, I think they had $200,000 and they put $20,000 into each company. And they did it um, in the summer. So right now you have the batch process and you have Y Combinator has a summer batch and the, and the winter batch. And the summer batch was basically the summer break for um, college students. And so you could choose to go do an, an internship at IBM or Oracle, or you could get funded by Y Combinator to pay your expenses. And uh, Reddit came out of that first batch, you know, a, a multi-billion dollar unicorn. Um, so fast forward to today, you've got, I think it's something like five to 10,000 accelerators worldwide. Um, you have them, you know, in different cities, fo uh, focused on different verticals. And um, yeah, so that sort of brings us forward to today in terms of the, the background for accelerators. Great, thank you. What were your expectations entering the accelerator and what were the actual outcomes? Alex, Sambwani, would you like to start there? Sure. Um, so my experience in, 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 in accelerator so is somewhat unique. So I, I did the Techstars Accelerator program um, summer of 2019. And I did that program immediately after leaving my job at Spotify before I had incorporated the business um, or really built anything. And so I was using the time in the accelerator really to figure out what my business really was, what the product was going to be. And so I spent a lot of my time doing customer discovery, um, leveraging the resources of the, the, the accelerator to make a lot of, I would say, kind of like idea progress. Um, and so my expectations going into the accelerator was that uh, one, I would come out of it under having a firm idea of what the product was going to be, what the business was going to be. Um, and two, I would also have access to capital that would help me um, la launch the business. Um, and all of the, those two assumptions ended up becoming true. So the, the resources that I had access to at Techstars really helped me um, make progress on the idea specifically the, there there are a bunch of mentors that they hook you up with that are business experts in different functions um, they really helped me figure out you know the product strategy go to market strategy um, or at least you know come up with an early plan for those things a lot of those things change over time as you learn um, and then on this the the uh, continuing on the learning piece you know connecting me with uh, other founders in the network um, just companies that are in the network as well as potential customers and, and this just discovery interviews really helped. Um, on the funding part, the, um, the the initial check that the accelerator writes is helpful. So for, for, for my particular business, the accelerator check was the first check into the, into the company. Um, and so it really gave me a launching pad to start spending money and, and learning, which, which helps. Um, and it also unlocked other funding opportunities. So just by virtue of being a part of the accelerator, had a lot of inbounds from angels, from VC funds. Um, many of those connections ended up turning into checks. Uh, so that, um, that, that was great. So I'll, I'll stop there. Thanks. Uh, Sarah, Sumio, would either of you like to chime in on your expectations versus actual outcomes? Yeah, sure. I can speak about our participation in Y Combinator. So we we, part, we officially participated in both StarTex and Y Combinator, 
but I can speak much more uh, to Y Combinator. StarTex, because of the, the time difference and a lot of their events were afternoon or evening time, uh, Pacific time, were just not uh, feasible for us to attend. So we, our startup is based in the UAE. I believe there's an 11 hour time difference. And I think Y Combinator takes this really into account. They also have founders in India, which is a couple of hours ahead of the UAE even. So, so they try to have all their events in morning time, uh, Pacific time. Anyways, our expectations going in, we had heard our, our primary motivation was to enable us to, to raise capital. We're a Middle Eastern based uh, startup and capital in the Middle East isn't as free flowing. And even investors in the Middle East typically like to see an international investor come in before they follow on. And international investors, you know, reasonably feel maybe not as comfortable investing in, in foreign startups, especially maybe the UAE was a relatively new geography for people to consider. I know that Mexico and, and certain other geographies started to become really hot in Silicon Valley. So we, we primarily applied and participated because we expected it to really make uh, fundraising a lot more accessible. And that was in fact the, the case. It really, uh, we, we connected with really amazing investors and we have now a cap table that we're super happy with. We raised the amount we were looking for at the valuation we were looking for. But other than that, I think we underestimated everything else we got out of the program. So, so many things, honestly. We had group partners who, you know, each group partner sees hundreds and advises hundreds of different startups. So they have this data set and they can advise and they can tell you, you know, for this particular obstacle that you have, XYZ startups did this, these other startups did this, and you might want to consider this. So they have a wealth of experience. Another perk uh, or another big value add from, from uh, YC was the network. So if you ever need to be connected with someone, want to speak with an expert in XYZ, you'll post on the internal forum and people are extremely helpful and, and will connect you to, to who you're looking to speak with. And the very last thing I would say that we really got out of it was actually emotional and psychological support. So they would have a lot of events and, and talks where you'd hear from the, you know, these big startups like Airbnb, Stripe, and you'd hear about the struggles they went through. And even, even in some of the weekly meetings you'd have with your, with your group or with your section, you'd go one by one and talk about what you're struggling with. And it would make you feel like, okay, this is the, the grind is just part of it. Uh, and it's, it's, it's motivating to hear that everyone is going through it and it's not easy. And if you, you know, if you keep on persevering, you can, you can do it. Thanks. Sumia? Yeah, I can go next. Uh, so I, I participated in the On Deck Founders program uh, around, at least around a year for, back from now. And just a little bit of background on On Deck is it's a newer organization that started three, four years ago. And Founders Program is their main flagship program. Now in the last year, they've spun up many other programs, um, but but mainly it was the Founder Program at that point. Um, and, and and so uh, like my expect and the Founders Program, I would say it's a little bit different from most accelerators that it's positioned more for people even before they have a real company. Uh, so, so what expectation I went into was that um, I had just left my real time job and I was, uh, I was uh, really uh, convinced that I wanted to start a company as my next step, but I didn't have, I, I had two or three sort of uh, ideas that I was exploring uh, still in the kind of the early stage where I was trying to validate them. Uh, so, and that's how a lot of people kind of enter that on deck founders program in that stage. Um, and then, so I, my, my hope or expectation from the program, the three months in spending in that program was that I, I develop enough conviction on one of those ideas by validating it more or discover something new in, in one of the spaces I was passionate about. Um, and ideally also maybe have a few co-founders, uh, uh, that, that I can collaborate with, uh, to work on that. So that was my expectation going into the program. And, um, Fortunately, at the three month end of it, we, uh, I started this company I work on today called Poised, 
so we started that company. I met my two co-founders as part of the program. So the three of us have been together since then, our co-founder, my co-founders. Uh, and we also raised uh, some substantial funding towards the end of the program. Uh, so all of those things uh, came true. Uh, I can scam in more detail how that happened. But in general, like I wouldn't say like most people kind of end up like that in the program, like around maybe 10%, 15%, 20% uh, ended up starting companies and raising funding. A lot of people decided that, okay, uh, maybe starting company is not what they want to do next or, or, or decide to join other company, which was at a pretty early stage. Uh, so people uh, kind of end up with uh, different uh, outcomes uh, at the end of it. Uh, but for me, definitely, it was very helpful spending those three time, three months uh, kind of uh, making use of the community that OnRec offered uh, to, to uh, kind of launch back from. Great, thanks. And, and also thank you for sharing uh, your insight from your peers as well, because that's, uh, that's definitely valuable data for the audience here. Uh, uh, Lawrence, did you have anything to add there? I think uh, everybody else covered most things. I think I'll just, the one thing I'll, I'll elaborate on a little bit is, um, you know, the, the, the partners or the advisors or kind of leaders of the accelerators oftentimes have a lot of data points, um, as Sarah mentioned. Um, and so it's really great to get their advice. They, you know, they kind of kind of help keep you out of the weeds and sort of say these are common pitfalls, these are common time wastes. Um, so they're they're really good about kind of keeping you on track and keeping you focused. And not only do they have sort of a lot of data points that they can share, but this was also sort of mentioned before, but I just think it's so important that I'll I'll mention it as well. Is you often have your your peers, and you can see like things that other people are struggling with. And you see how, and kind of share that you are struggling with the same things. And so it's really helpful uh, to have just the, the, just the, the shared experience with the other folks. And it's one of the reasons why the alumni network becomes so strong is you have this shared experience where you've gone through the accelerator together, um, have struggled through a lot of the same problems. Um, and then that you have these kind of long-term relationships that get built out of them. So um, I'll, I'll just, leave it at that, but that, that's, a, that's a big one for us. Great. Now, moving from the why to the how, how did you decide which accelerators to apply for? There seem to be new ones popping up very often. In, in my case, uh, the stage I was at, uh, most accelerators in that process, in that don't really take uh, people at that stage where you don't have a well-developed idea and team. Uh, uh, so that's why On Deck was a good fit. I think it was pretty unique in that way, uh, at least one year ago, uh, that it catered to that sort of uh, uh, need. And also, I mean, generally the community and selection they had of people was pretty high quality. Uh, and I knew about that uh, from other people who had joined the community before. So that's why I was attracted towards it. Um, we did consider joining or applying to Y Combinator later after on deck, but I think we decided against it mostly because we were able to raise funding from other channels with substantial funding. So it didn't feel like uh, we needed funding sort of support from Y Combinator. In fact, it feel, felt like giving away too much equity, uh, what Y Combinator asks for. And we already had a lot of other support that Y Combinator provided from on deck, like through the community. So it didn't feel like worth it. Okay, Lawrence? Yeah, what I was going to say was, um, you know, the, the, there's a tremendous benefits to these accelerators, but one of the biggest, most common drawbacks, which was just mentioned, which is they often take, a lot of equity. So it kind of varies by the accelerator, but typically you get about $100,000 and you give up sort of seven to 10% of your company, it really varies by the accelerator. Um, and oftentimes you can get a much better deal kind of in the markets and with angels or with, with uh, early stage funds than that. And so that tends to be the biggest drawback. Um, yes, how you, you, you pick them. One of the things that was uh, attractive for us about StartX is StartX doesn't cost anything and they don't take any equity. And so, you know, you have a lot of sellers that take equity or they charge you money. And StartX is great because it kind of was spun out of Stanford as a nonprofit, um, sort of separately funded. And we got to, you know, participate in this, uh, you know, this, this great um, organization and not have to give up any equity or, or pay any money. So that was one thing that was unique for us. And I know there's a lot of other you know, like I said, there's like five to 10,000 incubators out there. There's some that are focused on different verticals, different geographies. 
Now, how was the application process for you? What, what did the timeline look like? So the application process for Techstars, um, and also I forgot to mention this earlier, I also participated in the Stardex program, which, which I really enjoyed. But I'll speak to the application process for, for Techstars. Um, that process happens uh, over about the course of a month. There's multiple stages. So the first stage is um, you submit a written application and then there are a series of interviews. And the number of interviews you do is really dependent on um, the managing director of the program that you apply to. So uh, there are a bunch of different tech stores programs. I think there are over 70, like 70 programs in different cities with different, some of them have themes um, or specific verticals that they target. The one that I did was a generalist program um, in New York. Um, and so, so for that program, we had a specific managing director who, you know, for us, she made us do four different interviews across a month. Um, and the, it ended in an interview, a panel interview with 12 experts, basically, that were smart on our company um, in the space that we're in. Um, and it was very, uh, I would say, um, it was grueling in some sense. You have to really have your pitch down. Um, and so the way that we prepared was we just did a ton of mock interviews with people that um, had done the Techstars Accelerator as well as um, other accelerators. Um, so for us, we just tried to get as many reps as possible so that when we were in those interviews, we could access the answers super quickly and not, not waste any time. Um, so yeah, for us, it was just all about preparation and practice. Y Combinator has some similarities, some differences. So we applied in September 2020. Uh, we, you first submit a written application and then they decide whether you're invited to interview. The next step is an, uh, an interview uh, on, on Zoom. And there's only one interview and it only lasts, I believe, for 10 minutes. So it's super short. Um, and they come to their decision really quickly. Uh, so they'll let you know. So they let us know. I believe it was end of November. Uh, we, so we submitted the written application um, uh, end of September, uh, we heard back in November and uh, immediately, sorry, no, actually, there was some time between when we knew that we would be interviewed and when the actual interview was scheduled. The interview lasts for 10 minutes and in Y Combinator, they're known to interrupt you. So one tip amongst others when you interview with them over Zoom is that you use what's called the, the inverted pyramid where you give a short answer um, to the question they asked you, and then you dive, dive into an elaboration. So if they cut you off, they got the gist of the answer, as opposed to you giving a very long-winded answer and then being cut off. And that's pretty much the timeline. The program itself is uh, three months, but you can join the community before your cohort officially begins, so you can make use of the resources. Uh, and of course, the use resources are available any time after you, you graduate from the program. Great. Um, so Lawrence, you are joining Y Combinator's first early admission batch. Could you tell us a bit more how that works? Yeah, sure. So I think it's the first time they've done early admission. I'm not 100% positive. It might have done early admission, the pre batch, but it sounds about right or at least close enough. Um, yeah, so historically, you know, there were sort of two deadlines. And if you, you know, didn't get in, then you had to wait another six months to apply. And so uh, with the proliferation of accelerators, there's some out there that have rolling admissions or um, more, more dates. And so at least very recently, YC um, opened up early admission. And so we, uh, I think right now the statistic is something like 50% of companies in batch and Y Combinator have already been rejected at least once. And we were, we were one of those. So we applied and we were rejected on our first try. And um, we then applied early, like right when the early deadline, uh, right when they opened up early applications, which was like a couple months later, I think maybe two, two, two or so months later. And right away, they said, okay, we want to interview you again and really wanted to see kind of what we had done in the last two to three months. And we showed a lot of progress and, you know, we got in. So uh, we got in, I think, in July of, of this summer for what starts in June. 
And oh, sorry, in, in January. And so um, it was it's fantastic because one, it gives you immediate access to everything. We already got our, our we got funded. We got the YC money. Um, we've already been doing office hours with the group partners. Um, we've already been kind of getting, there's a lot of like, sort of like nuts and bolts stuff you have to kind of get out of the way. And we've kind of got, to, got that all right out of the way. And so it's been great in terms of just hitting like the in batch time um, with a running start. So, you know, I think like the other thing about applying early is I have a lot of, you know, friends or contacts that reach out and say, you know, should I apply? Should I not apply? Like we're not that for a long yet. Like we're not really sure. And I usually say apply. Like I think it's great. It's a good learning process. It's a good kind of um, exercise to go through to be able to kind of flush out your ideas, gives you a deadline. And it's very common not to get in the first time. I think it's like 50% of people uh, don't get in the first time. And so, you know, apply again and you'll you know, probably have a better shot at getting in. Thanks. Now, moving to what before the live Q&A, uh, what ownership does a founder give up to an accelerator? Lawrence, you touched on that briefly for Y Combinator. Um, what did you receive in exchange in terms of financing and support for the ownership you gave up, if that was the case? I know um, that's the case for YC and Techstars. Um, on deck is structured a little different. Sumia, do you want to kick that off uh, and share how on deck is different? Yeah, so uh, so I think uh, uh, when when I did the program, uh, on deck was structured in the way that uh, for joining the founders program, there's only a cash fee, so there, uh, so you have to pay uh, as a founder. You pay at that time it was fifteen hundred dollars. I think now it's higher. Um, but but you got access to the program just by paying the cash fee and and there was no uh, no sort of commitment around equity you had to give up in your company uh, when you established the company and, and, and things like that um, although on deck was ready and, and even in our case they did they did fund us uh, they did give us some funding when we established the company and for that they took some equity but that was not something that we had committed to when we joined the program um, but I know that actually just last week on deck changed its structure. Uh, and so now they have an accelerator program that's very similar in structure to Y Combinator, um, where they, where they do take 7% equity and give $125,000. Um, uh, so, so in terms of like that equity structure, it's very similar. They still have the founders program, which is kind of what they position now you can join before you have an established company um where they where they don't take equity so so now they have two programs one one is down deck founders program and one is what they call odx which is more more like y combinator more similar to y combinator alex do you have um something to share for, from uh, your perspective on tech stars and startx yeah so for tech stars when i did the program um the deal was you got um there were two options you could uh the the minimum you could do is that was six percent in exchange for twenty thousand dollars and then there was an optional um one hundred thousand dollars that you could take um on a note that was a, a three three million dollar cap so um an additional three percent ish but there's there's some flexibility in, in that note depending on if you've raised money before so anyway all in you're giving up somewhere between 6% and 9-ish and percent of your, of your company, um, depending on how much money you want to take. And uh, that's a lot <laughs> to give up of your company, right? So um, you really have to think about what you're going to get out of it and, whether, and what that's worth to you. Uh, for us, we were very early when we did the program. And so we felt that the funding opportunities going through the accelerator um, that, that we would have access to would make it worth it. Also, there's a halo effect, depending on the accelerator you go to, like you do get like a boost in terms of demand. So that means you might be able to raise more money on better terms. So you have to think about that and how, and, and, and that and put the, the ownership that you're giving up front um, in, in that context. So, hey, yes, we are giving away this money up front, but through being a part of this program, we actually might get access to more money and, and, and end up with a better deal net net, you know? Um, so that's how we thought about it. 
So what signal does participation in an accelerator send to investors and when might the signal actually be negative? I think generally the signal is positive um, it, because it's very hard to get into an accelerator. Pretty, most of the accelerators have very low acceptance rates, like below, below 5%, some of them below 1%. Um, I know Techstars is the, the program that we did. I think the acceptance rate was, was like 0.5%. So like just by being filtered through all of those companies, investors, um, can see that you are a, a high quality company on some level. Um, so I think generally it's a really good thing. I think when the accelerator can be a bad, bad signal is if the company is like really far along, you know, and has made a lot of progress and then goes to an accelerator that might send the signal that the company is struggling to raise funds. Um, and then the other way it could be negative is if, is if a company is doing like multiple accelerators over and over and over again, investors might wonder why that is, you know, are these, is that company just doing multiple accelerators because they, they want the, the, those 100 K ish checks from all the accelerators because they can't raise the money through other means. Um, that's, that's just my two cents. I'm, I'm sure there's other thoughts. Sumi, are you shaking your head? Would you like to add something there? No, I, I think I mostly agree with uh, what Alex uh, just just said. Uh, uh, like in our, our case, maybe uh, when we were considering Y Combinator, there was some concern from some investors that uh, the amount of equity Y Combinator takes maybe uh, and the terms they asked for maybe too much compared to what we are asking from other investors. Uh, so that, that felt a bit maybe unfair to other investors. Uh, so that's that's similar to uh, like if you have progressed to some stage and if you have raised some level of funding outside of accelerators, then sometimes the uh, going to an accelerator could be a bad signal for or a concern for others. Great. Now, what should investors pay particular attention to during diligence of companies that have been through an accelerator? I hear from some angel investors who say uh, some accelerator programs are notorious for coaching uh, founders on building FOMO, the fear of missing out. Um, what are your thoughts around that? I, I can jump in um, specifically with regards to Y Combinator. They very much caution you to be very transparent and and honest and there's definitely none of the coaching around around building FOMO. I think it's become a bit difficult for investors because the startups that do generate a lot of excitement coming out of Y Combinator, typically it's it's gotten to the phase. Yeah, perhaps perhaps interest isn't equitably split between startups out of Y Combinator and startups in Y Combinator because oftentimes you might be interested in a startup and if you don't move quickly enough, you lose the chance to, to participate in the round for the, the most in demand startups. So it makes it hard to do proper due diligence as opposed to buying into the, the vision that they're selling, uh, what, any information you can get online and during demo day and then just committing. Okay. Thanks very much. Now it's time for the live audience Q&A. Audience members, you may use the raise hand or chat feature to ask questions of the panelists and please feel free to turn your videos on. We'd love to make this as interactive as possible. Subhan, uh, would you like to go ahead and speak? Yeah, can, you, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Um, yeah, so I guess my question is kind of around, um, you know, when is, maybe someone hit this earlier, One's kind of the optimal point um, to go for an accelerator um, because I know that you know it's never too early to apply, but there's probably a point in your company's lifetime where the value you're going to get out of it is going to get you that you know two or three x outcome that makes it worth it. What are your kind of thoughts on that? Um, I mean, I can take a, a try at that. I think if you're if you're if you're sold on the accelerator is going to help you and. You look at the trade-offs and you feel like, yes, 
at some point this is going to be the right thing for me. Um, I think as soon as you can get in, you should, you should do it. Um, because, you know, the further along you get as a company, the less and less sense it makes. Like you, you're not going to see a company that's already had a Series C financing go through Accelerator. Um, and so I think the sooner you can get in, the faster you can move. And that's, that's the name of the game of startups is growth and moving fast. And so the, the, the sooner you can hit that accelerator to help, help you speed up even faster, I think, you know, from my perspective, that's, that's when the time is right. Um, you know, as soon as you can get in it, you will see, like, for example, I told you we were rejected our first time. Uh, we applied for Optory. And when we were rejected, of course, you know, it hurts a little bit. You feel a little bit bad about that. But when we talked about it, we felt like maybe we're a little too early. Maybe we're not quite ready to capitalize on the opportunity. And I think that's the case. Like, I think we're much better off now, um, having got in, you know, now for this next batch versus had we, had we um, gotten in the first time we applied. So, you know, there are a lot of rejections. And, um, you know, I, I feel like you could let them make that decision for you. If you can't get in, maybe you're a little too early. Maybe you haven't figured out the right, figured everything out yet, or maybe you're not quite ready um, yet. So I feel like as soon as you can get in, that's when the time is right from, from, from our, my, my uh, perspective. Yeah, I would agree with that. Um, I think as soon as you can get in is probably the right move. Um, I'd also, I'd add one, one way you can think about that and, and it is, you know, do you have an MVP that you've validated that you can eat, like you can grow basically through, throughout a, um, a 10 ish week, you know, diff there are different lengths of time that these accelerators are, that they happen over, but, you know, can you go into a program and use all the resources to grow? Um, so it's kind of, it's hard, I think, to do that if your product isn't ready yet, um, because you're, you, when you're in an accelerator, a lot of them are structured in such a way where you're measured week over week on, on your progress. You have to have KPIs that you set up in the beginning of the program, and you're checking in with your mentor or um, whoever it is in the program week over week tracking progress. And if you don't have a product that's growing, um, it's hard to show progress, really. Um, so just keep that, that in mind. Um, but I, I think that, uh, I would, I would definitely underscore, um, Lawrence's answer as soon as you can get in, um, uh, do it, but understand that if you don't have a product yet, it's going to feel harder <laughs> because you're going to be compared to people that are growing and you might feel a little, um, self-conscious, self-conscious about that. We have a question in the chat. What would you change about the accelerators that you participated in? Well, I'll, I'll just volunteer to, you know, one, so I, I went through YC in 2012, 10, 10 years ago, and it was all in person. And that YC now is fully 100% remote. Um, and I suspect, you know, so StartX is a hybrid, some remote, some, um, some in person. Um, I definitely feel like there's there's a lot that's lost when you go to 100% remote. Um, this a uh, face-to-face interaction. I remember doing the, the YC dinners, which are really famous. Everybody comes in. It's like almost like you go you know to a, a dorm and everybody's getting food and you kind of meeting new people. Just these like um, spontaneous meetings, and then you have these famous speakers that would come in and talk and have these kind of off-the-record conversations. I think like I'm seeing everything going all remote now with post pandemic. And I think what I would like to see change is, is to, I'd like to see things come back to an in-person component because I think there's a lot that can be gained from, from that. In my experience, there's, there's a lot of pressure to raise, as, raise money as soon as possible. Um, and I think as a company, it's your, as a founder, it's really your, job to understand when is the right time to raise capital. Um, I think there's like all of these accelerators are not all, but a lot of them are structured in such a way where you do the program and then you do a demo day and then you raise money around the demo day because it makes a lot of sense. Um, we, we did that. We raised some money around the demo day, but in hindsight, I wish I would have waited a little longer till we were a little further along to raise the money that we raised because we would have done it on, on better terms if we had just waited a little bit. But we, we felt pressured to raise because all the other companies were raising and 
Um, there's just this, that's how the program is structured where it's like you raise money at the end. Um, and I'm, it's not necessarily a critique on the program. It's more of just like a, it's just a call out that there like happens to be groupthink when you're in these programs. And so you need to make sure that you're not so affected by that. And I'm not, I don't think it's the necessarily fully the accelerator's job to manage that. Um, but um, yeah, I think it's, it's just important to remember that like you're your own company and you should do what's best for you in whatever moment. Um, yeah, if that makes sense. Thanks. Uh, Rob, you have your hand raised. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm trying to get like a better idea of um, sort of the, the tangible value that you're getting from the accelerator. Like, would you say like, you know, 50% is the signaling effect that makes next rounds earlier, 30% is sort of the network while during the three month period, 20% is the sort of the network afterwards. Like, how do you, how do you think about um, like where the actual value is. So I can say in, in case of on deck, at least it's it's most like 80%, I would say the network, uh, a lot of it during the program itself, uh, where it's connecting to uh, your early users uh, or potential customers. Um, uh, your uh, potential teammates, co-founders, early employees, um, and then also just like a support group that's there with you all the time. Uh, like I did, uh, like they set you up with like a cohort of ten other founders who who, who I'm who I still meet every month till today, and we kind of uh, help each other out, uh, discuss sort of uh, issues with that we are facing in each of our companies, uh, things like that. Um, so yeah, and then uh, in general, the community is very helpful for problem solving, like any issues we are facing, like we can post it in forums and pretty, people are pretty active in helping you how they've solved those problems within their companies. Uh, so at least in your case of on deck, the network is, is uh, really valuable. And then we already mentioned connecting to uh, investors and stuff also as part of that. Um, and, and then uh, some of it is definitely halo effect to being part of the community in, in case of on deck. It, it also varies by, by company. Every company has its own unique needs and every company is in a different stage. When you have some companies that are still at the idea phase and other companies that might be already over a million dollars a year run rate. So it really depends on the company. One thing that we haven't talked about that's actually really, um, really valuable and really impactful, at least I've seen it within the Y Combinator um, network, is uh, warm leads to other companies that are part, that are part of that accelerator. So I know some YC founders that really kind of applied to YC because uh, their main factor was, you know, once you're sort of in, they make it really easy to kind of share and even market your product to other YC companies. And you know, there's thousands of YC companies. Within YC, they have something called like this deals page. And you can sort of search and they've got different categories, recruiting products, marketing products, uh, DevOps products, like everything you can imagine. And um, it turns out you can get a lot of customers just from within the, net, the, the accelerator that you're a part of. Um, you know, like Brex, for example, right? Like the, you, you, Brex is pretty, pretty prominent inside of YC to all YC companies. And partly that's them and partly that's YC, but they're really, really marketing, you know, helping to get, you know, YC companies um, hands products into the hands of other YC companies. There's a huge cross-pollination that's happening, especially for B2B products. Um, you know, you, uh, like Segment, could you... for example, is another one. Amplitude, which just went public gusto. You know, all these companies, YC companies, all use each other's products. It's a really big factor for growth. Sorry, Sheila, go ahead. Uh, could you just mention what Brex does? Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a business like credit card. So, you know, instead of using like Amex, you'd use Brex. They have a credit card and they also have a cash account. So it's sort of like if you um, were a new like founder starting a company, even like somebody that's maybe recently out of college, a lot of people go into accelerators right out of college and you have limited credit history or limited, you know, credit ability for, for purchases. And meanwhile, you've got a startup and you have these big expenses. They'll look at like how much money you've raised um, as a way to extend your line of credit. 
And not only that, but they will also um, give you a bigger line of credit just based on the fact that you got into Y Combinator or Techstars or 500 Startups or whatever it is. But I think the, the point is sort of that, that there's a lot of cross-pollination of products within the accelerators. It's a, it can be a big source of growth. Thank you. I have a question in the chat asking how much uh, equity Y Combinator takes. I, I know it was mentioned they'd uh, appreciate that information again. How much equity does Y Combinator take? They take 7% for $125K. And they also have the option if they want uh, to come into a future round and purchase another uh, 4% I believe at the, the price of that round, they can exercise that option if they want, they, they might not. A final question for the panelists, what's your ask from the audience? Sarah, would you like to start? Yeah, sure. Um, if, uh, if you, ever pass by the UAE, or if you have friends and family in the UAE, please do uh, let them know about Zina. Zina, as Sheila mentioned, is Cash App or Venmo, but for the UAE. Um, yeah, that's pretty much it. Great. Alex? Alex Zambani? Sure. Similar. Yeah. Um... I'm going to play a similar tune to Sarah. Uh, if, please check out our website, helloslang.com. We sell our products to e-commerce brands and to restaurants. And basically what it helps those businesses do is answer more of their phone calls better. So improve their customer experience, which is especially a pain point during the holidays. So check out our website, helloslang.com. If you know anyone that can benefit from our products, please, um, please send them our way. Yeah, in a similar vein, like uh, for all of you, uh, any of you who do a lot of uh, important online meetings, presentations nowadays, especially with remote work, uh, whether you're a manager, a founder, executive, a salesperson, um, any profession really, uh, check us out at poise.com uh, and, and maybe you'll be interested. So do sign up or just directly reach out to me if you'd like to try out the product. Um, also, I mean, I generally love helping startups uh, or people who want to start something in any way I can. So reach out if, if I can help out in any way too. Thank you. Great, thanks. Lawrence? Yeah, you know, I, I just noticed I, I got a couple of people send uh, LinkedIn requests while we were on and I accepted what I, what I could. If anyone wants to connect on LinkedIn, would love to do that. I'll try and see if I can send a few, but if anybody wants to stay in touch, that's probably an easy way to do so. Um, and then, yeah, a little plug for our company. We're a consumer data privacy tool and we have a lot of Stanford alums that use it. We have a lot of VCs that use it, a lot of entrepreneurs. Um, so what we do is we remove your home address, phone number, email and other private information from the internet. We're opt-out software. And so the way we do this is we opt you out of the top data brokers that trade in this information and post it online. So if you've ever Googled your own name and seen results from companies like Been Verified or Instant Checkmate or Spokio or White Pages or Cell Revealer or Free Phone Tracer, um, we basically opt people out of those, um, those sites. And we have a free sign up. Um, so anybody could just sign up and we um, send you a report of all the places that you've been found online. And then some people choose to upgrade um, to get us to remove their information. So if you want to take a look at it, that would be cool. Or if you wanted to uh, connect on LinkedIn and you know stay in touch, if there's anything that makes sense to talk about, we'd love to connect in other ways. Thanks very much to Alex and Bonnie, Lauren, Sarah, Sumya, and the audience for today's incredible discussion on Startup Accelerators. We hope to see you again soon. I'll hand it over to co-president Alex Montalbini for upcoming announcements. All right. Well, thank you, Sheila. Uh, this concludes today's session. Uh, thank you, everyone, for your wonderful participation.